Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with picture tests and practical anatomy of the thorax. This video is on the heart, part one. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Coronary angiography performed on a 70-year-old man showed severe narrowing of the artery indicated by the pointer. Which of the following structures is less likely affected by the obstruction? This is an anterior view of the heart showing the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle. Note that the right ventricle forms most of the anterior surface. Also note the anterior interventricular sulcus, which separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle on the anterior surface of the heart. It contains the anterior interventricular artery and the great cardiac vein. The anterior interventricular artery is a branch of the left coronary artery. It is also called left anterior descending or LAD, and it is the most common site of occlusion. About 40 to 50 percent of the cases of occlusion of coronary arteries. Left anterior descending gives one or two large diagonal branches, which, as their name indicates, may arise and descend diagonally across the anterior surface of the left ventricle. So in that case, the left ventricle will be affected in obstruction of the left anterior descending. It also supplies small branches to the right ventricle. Although it is not the main blood supply of the right ventricle, which is mainly supplied by the right coronary artery. But because it receives some small branches from the left anterior descending, then the right ventricle might also be affected by obstruction of left anterior descending. Left anterior descending also supplies septal branches. I'm going to draw them interrupted here because they pass into the interventricular septum, including the AV bundle of the conducting system, which passes through the membranous part of the interventricular septum and then splits into right and left bundle branches. So therefore, the AV bundle might be affected. Now regarding the AV nodes, in 80% of the individuals, the AV nodal artery is given from the right coronary artery just before it gives its posterior interventricular branch. But in 20% of the cases, it is the circumflex artery that supplies the AV nodal branch. And this is when the circumflex artery supplies the posterior interventricular artery in case of left coronary dominance. Therefore, the AV nodal artery either arises from the right coronary artery or it arises from the circumflex branch and there is no way that it arises from the anterior interventricular artery. Therefore, the AV node is least likely affected by obstruction of the anterior interventricular artery. In which pericardial sinus are the tip of the fingers placed and which heart chamber is located anterior to the pad of the inserted fingers? In this view, when the hand is passed in the pericardial cavity inferior to the heart, then the fingers can access the oblique pericardial sinus. This sinus is located between the right and left pulmonary veins and the inferior vena cava. So it is the oblique pericardial sinus. Now the heart chamber which is located anterior to the pads of the inserted finger is the chamber that forms the posterior part of the heart, which is the base of the heart, that faces the apex of the heart. The base of the heart is formed by the left atrium. Keep in mind that the esophagus is located posterior to the oblique pericardial sinus. Therefore, the pads of the fingers will face the left atrium, while the nails will touch posteriorly the esophagus. Identify the structure A, B specific. What is the surface anatomical landmark of the area B? This is a longitudinal section of the heart showing the right atrium with its thin wall, right ventricle with a thicker wall, and the left ventricle, which is the thickest chamber. The left atrium forms the posterior chamber of the heart and is not sectioned in this cut, but its oracle can be seen 
on the left border of the heart between the left ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. The structure A is located in the left ventricle. It is a conical elevation of cardiac muscle fibers called papillary muscle. In the left ventricle, there are two papillary muscles, anterior and posterior. They project into the cavity of the ventricle. The anterior is connected to the interventricular septum, which is located anteriorly, and is also called the septal papillary muscle. The one labeled A is that's the posterior papillary muscle, which is more posterior. Remember that the left ventricle is anatomically located posterior to the right ventricle and not only to the left. Area B forms the apex of the heart. It is clearly part of the left ventricle. Note the thickness of the region and compare it with the remaining parts of the left ventricle. The apex of the heart points inferiorly and to the left and slightly anteriorly. It is thus located in the left fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line. And this is the surface anatomical landmark of the apex of the heart. The apex beat can be felt just medial to that point, And in cases of left ventricular hypertrophy, you would expect the apex beat to shift more laterally to the left. Match each lettered structure with a numbered heart chamber. First, we have to identify the numbered heart chambers. This is a cross-section of the heart passing through the right and left ventricle. Note that the cavity of the thinner walled right ventricle is flattened and becomes crescentic by the forward bulge of the interventricular septum, while the section of the left ventricle is circular. Note that the interventricular septum has the thickness of the left ventricle. Thus, the marker 1 is located in the right ventricle, while the marker 2 is located in the left ventricle. Now let's look at the latter options. A, moderator band. The moderator band is a ridge of cardiac muscle fibers that lies in the cavity of the right ventricle. It is not shown in this section, but it is a unique feature of the right ventricle. So A goes with one. The aortic vestibule is the outflow tract of the left ventricle that leads to the aortic orifice. It lies between the upper end of the interventricular septum membrane is part of the interventricular septum, and the anterior cusp of the mitral valve. It is thus a feature of the left ventricle, so it goes with two. The infundibulum is the upward narrowing of the right ventricle as it approaches the pulmonary orifice. It is funnel-shaped, hence the name infundibulum, which means funnel in Latin. It is also called the conus arteriosus. Note that the walls of the infundibulum are smooth. They lack the trabeculae carni, which are located elsewhere in the ventricle. So, C, the infundibulum, goes with 1. Then the apex of the heart, D, is formed by the left ventricle. So, D goes with 2. Identify the structure indicated by the arrow in which part of the cardiac cycle does it become taut. This is a view of the inside of the left ventricle. You can see the interior of the cavity, which shows a series of muscular ridges in the wall called the trabeculae carni. Also, you can see the edges and the inferior surfaces of the cusps of the mitral valve receive the attachment of cords or threads of fibrous tissue called the cordy tendini. The cordy tendini are much like the cords of a parachute. They are inelastic and they diverge from the conical elevations of cardiac muscle fiber, which are called the papillary muscles. Papillary muscles project from the trabeculae carni. The cordy tendini, they prevent the cusps of the mitral valve and also the tricuspid valve, which has a much similar architecture. They prevent the cusps of these atrioventricular valves, whether on the right or on the left, from being driven into the atrium as ventricular pressure rises during ventricular history. In other words, they prevent eversion of the valves by pulling them down. The cords, the cordy tendini, which are made of inelastic connective tissue fibers, will thus become taut during ventricular systole. Which of the valves 1, 2, or 3 is specifically auscultated in this patient? This is a longitudinal section of the heart showing the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle. The pulmonary trunk, which is directed upwards and to the left, is located at a more anterior plane than this section. Thus, we can see only the deeper located ascending aorta, 
guarded by its semilunar valve, the aortic valve, in two. The aorta is obviously arising from the left ventricle and directed upwards and to the right. One is the right atrioventricular or tricuspid valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And three is the bicuspid mitral or left atrioventricular valve. The valves one, two, three, as well as the pulmonary valve, which is not shown here, are grouped so closely on an oblique line behind the sternum, anatomically speaking. This line joins the third left costal cartilage with the sixth right costal cartilage. However, their anatomical location is not too much of clinical interest because the sounds produced by these valves are best heard on the chest wall at other sites called auscultatory areas where they are listened to at their anatomical locations, it is not possible to distinguish clearly between the sounds of these valves because they are all aggregated in one place. Hence, the valve sounds are listened to at certain auscultatory areas which are as wide apart as possible so that the sounds produced by any given valve may be clearly distinguished from those produced by other valves. The normal heart sounds are produced when the valves are closed because blood tends to carry the sound in the direction of its flow, then each area of these auscultatory areas is situated superficial to the chamber or vessel through which the blood has passed and in a direct line with the valve orifice. Now, if you look at the picture of auscultation of the thorax, you will notice that the stethoscope is located in the left fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line, or it is just below and medial to the nipple. At this location, the mitral valve, indicated by three, is best heard. Remember that this is the same surface anatomical landmark of the apex of the heart. The tricuspid valve in one is best heard just to the left of the inferior end of the sternum. The aortic valve in two is heard over the medial end of the right second intercostal space, while the pulmonary valve, which is not shown here, is heard over the medial end of the left second intercostal space. Identify the heart chamber A and name the two layers that make up the covering B. This is a longitudinal section of the heart showing the right atrium, right ventricle, and the left ventricle, which is the thickest chamber. The left atrium forms the posterior chamber of the heart and is not sectioned in this cut, but its auricular appendage can be seen at A. It is located on the left border of the heart between the left ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. So A is the left auricular appendage. The heart is surrounded by the pericardial sac. This pericardium not only surrounds the heart, but also extends to the beginning of the great vessels. The pericardium consists of two layers, a strong outer fibrous layer, which you can see from this side and from here. It is one of the layers represented in B. It is the outer side or outer layer of the fold B. The second part of the pericardium is called the serous pericardium and is enclosed within the fibrous pericardium. This serous pericardium, like other serous membranes, like the pleura and peritoneum, consists of a parietal layer that lines the fibrous pericardium and firmly adherent to it, and a visceral layer that is closely applied to the heart, consists part of the external or outer wall of the heart, the epicardium. Therefore, the inner layer of the fold B is formed of parietal serous pericardium and the two layers that form B are the fibrous pericardium from the outside and the parietal layer of the serous pericardium from the inside. You can see that it is smooth and glistening from the inside because it is lined with mesothelium and it secretes pericardial fluid, a serous fluid that is located in the pericardial cavity which is located here between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium. On the other hand, the parietal layer of the pericardium cannot be separated and there is no space between it and the fibrous pericardium. What is the origin of artery A? Which vessels open into chamber B? 
This is an anterior view of the heart showing the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. The left atrium forms the posterior part of the heart, posterior chamber of the heart, the base of the heart, and only its auricular appendage, left auricular appendage, can be seen on the left border of the heart between the left ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. Also note the anterior interventricular groove between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. It contains the artery A that carries the name of the sulcus, the anterior interventricular artery, also called left anterior descending artery. It is one of the two branches of the left coronary artery. The other branch is the circumflex branch. Note that the left anterior descending pass downwards toward the apex of the heart, which is formed by the left ventricle. It will anastomose with the termination of the posterior interventricular artery on the inferior surface of the heart. As I have just mentioned, this artery, the left anterior descending, is a branch of the left coronary artery. The main stem of the left coronary artery divides into an anterior interventricular and a circumflex branch, which is not shown here. Now B is the auricle of the posterior chamber of the heart, the left atrium, and the left atrium, which is located behind the heart, receives the four pulmonary veins, two from each side, right and left.